fine. How are you? I'm fine. Good to see you. Um, well, as you know, my name is Mike Sasso. I'm the chairman of the JFC. The way we're going to proceed this afternoon is um, we've never done it this way before, so we're all learning together. Um, we're going to go into each of the little uh, virtual rooms, and each of the commissioners will uh, introduce themselves to you. Um, you will then have three or four minutes to make an opening statement. That will be followed by a question and answer period, and I'll watch the clock and make sure I save three or four minutes for you at the end. So again, good afternoon, Mike Sasso, Chair. Good afternoon. Commissioner Bardos. Good afternoon, I'm Andy Bardos with Gray Robinson. I'm in Indy Atlantic. Good afternoon. Commissioner uh, Blocker. Hello, I'm Lauren Blocker. I'm in house counsel with FIS and I'm in Ponte Vedra, which is in St. John's County. Good afternoon. Commissioner Citro. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Vincent Citro with the law offices of Horowitz and Citro in downtown Orlando. Good afternoon. Commissioner DeArmas. Hello, David DeArmas, Kramer Price and DeArmas in Orlando. Good afternoon. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Dyer. Uh, Craig Dyer, Daytona Beach, uh, former chief assistant at the Public Defender's Office. Good afternoon. Commissioner Eisnagel. Good afternoon. I'm Carrie Eisnagel and I'm in Sanford. Good afternoon. Commissioner Thomas. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Scott Thomas with the Burr Foreman Law Firm up in Ponte Vedra Beach, St. John's County. Good afternoon. Judge, you have the floor. Well, first of all, I want to thank all of you. I know that you have devoted a substantial amount of time to this entire process. Uh, so I commend you for your performing this very, very important service. I believe that serving as a judge is a calling. I also believe that I'm called to serve in a capacity where I can use my abilities philosophy, education, and experience to provide the most benefit for our community. I'm seeking this position because I humbly believe that I can fulfill my duty to our community by serving on the Fifth District Court of Appeal. I look forward to answering your questions here today while we're together this afternoon. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I assigned uh, you to Commissioner Thomas, and he will begin the questioning. Your Honor, um, I did uh, have the assignment to vet your application. It's actually the second time I've done that. Um, certainly the extent your colleagues and those appear before you have great respect for your intellect and your judicial temperament is evident. Um, and you should, whatever else comes with the process, you should be proud of that, certainly. Um, I'd like to start maybe with the general. Um, what qualities or characteristics should the governor look for in filling this spot? And where in your um, service, do we see those qualities exemplified? Uh, thank you for that. Well, uh, the governor has a tough, tough job to do. I wouldn't presume to impinge on his authority, but I do believe that, um, number one, I think the most important attribute any judge can have is humility. And in my mind, when I use the term humility, I believe that encompasses honesty, integrity, faithfulness to the rule of law, and staying within the sphere that governs judges. Because if you're truly humble, and I try to be, and I do say try, because I don't always get it right, but if you're really being humble, you understand your position within our government structure. And that is to interpret the law and not make law, uh, that's for the legislature, not enforce the law, that's for the executive. It's for a judge, and I try to do this as best I can, to interpret the law as it's written and apply it on the case-by-case -case basis that's presented to me. Um, and I think my record demonstrate, demonstrates that uh, collectively, uh, but with respect to my application, I did submit two writing samples for the Singh case and the Ortiz case. And I believe that demonstrates uh, not only my commitment to doing that, but that I can actually do it. 
Given, look, you're a very well respected circuit court judge. Um, that comes with not uh, insignificant advantages. You, you you run your courtroom, you have your docket, you are the boss. Um, why would you want to give that up and go to a cloistered environment where you work on a collegial basis, no less than groups of three? Um, I don't know that I see the advantage of doing that. Why, why are you interested in doing that? Well, I'm, I'm interested in a couple of reasons. One, as I indicated earlier, I think that my passion for legal analysis, uh, doing research, a, a lot of the things that an appellate judge does, uh, that quite frankly, we don't have time to do as much as a circuit judge. Uh, I, I think I would enjoy that personally. I think I would get fulfillment and I think I could serve our community uh, because I believe that I would, I would do it well. I would certainly work hard. I'm a hard worker. I think my colleagues and uh, lawyers will tell you that. Um, I have a work ethic, but also I have experience. I was on the city council for Maitland and I enjoyed the collegial environment of, of being on a body that makes decisions not by one person, but a group of people. And I believe that those skills that I developed with the city council, um, skills that I developed in-house as a labor and employment lawyer in my practice, uh, not only did I defend my clients in court, but quite frankly, most of my time was spent day-to-day uh, -day giving advice to my clients and, again, working collegially with people to come to the appropriate solution. And I think I could, I could do that and do that well and do that effectively without sacrificing core principles uh, as a member of the Fifth District Court of Appeal. By, by the way, in terms of your work, I, I should have been that at the outset. If one more person had told me about you being the first in, last out of the courthouse, I, I was going to give up. Um, so... Well, Mr. Thomas, I will say in, in full disclosure, I am not the first in. I may be the last out, but I don't think I'm the first in. <laughs> okay. Um, we, we, we've done this a few times. Is there anything, Your Honor, in particular, since I guess we did this maybe last August, anything you'd point out in the last year and a half now, a little over a year that you think is uh, something new, something that helps inform your application or your potential service that you could share with us? Uh, sure. Uh, one, one of my cases that is on uh, my list of most significant cases as a judge is the uh, State v. Nelson case, which was a capital case. Uh, the jury ended up not recommending a, a death sentence, and so I sentenced Mr. Nelson to life imprisonment. Uh, that had just been just been done in July when the interviews, I believe, were in August of last year. Since then, earlier this year, I was affirmed uh, by the Fifth District Court of Appeal in a per curiam decision. Um, so that was um, very satisfying to me uh, to know that, well, I don't know if I did everything right, but I didn't commit reversible error. So I was glad to do that. And that was uh, because that was a very um, very important case for me, a very emotional case, very taxing emotionally, taxing intellectually, but that, that happened. I also served again uh, as an associate judge on the fifth district uh, in October. And so that is something different that happened. And I actually uh, wrote an opinion. Uh, the motion for rehearing time has not expired, so it's not final, but I did uh, write a very it's a very brief opinion. It's certainly no uh, Crawford v. Washington or anything <laughs> like that. But those are the things that immediately come to mind since the last time I interviewed. Well, perfect. Well, I appreciate your, your, your comments today, and I'll let my fellow commissioners chime in. Uh, thank you very much, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Bardos? Good afternoon, Judge. Good afternoon. So 16 of our 23 applicants for this position are trial judges, um, and, and our challenge is to um, come up with a short list. Um, so without, um, without referring to any of the other individual applicants, what is it about your experience and your application that should stand out to us? All right. Um, and I, I agree 
uh, Mr. Bardos, you do have a very uh, difficult job. A lot of applicants, um, and I'm sure I don't know a lot of them, but the, they are all very highly qualified applicants. All I could say with respect to my application, uh, I would refer to what I already said um, to Mr. Thomas about serving on the city council, uh, working in a collegial environment on the council as a labor and employment lawyer. Um, I think that gives me not only experience doing that, but it also gives me, particularly the city council aspect, a personal uh, understanding of the importance of separation of powers. Because I have served um, as a member of a branch other than the judicial branch when I served as a city council person. And that was the legislative branch in Maitland, my city where I live. Uh, it's a city manager council form of government. So we do not have an, you know, a strong mayor, but we perform legislative functions. So I appreciate that in a way that I don't know a lot of uh, my other applicants do. Um, I also have an engineering degree um, as an undergraduate. And I think that uh, I think sort of frames quite frankly, my philosophy to a large extent. I, I am a textualist. And I think that really started in my training as engineering because there's formulas in engineering, force equals mass times acceleration and the meaning of F and M and A don't change. It has a meaning <laughs> and that's what you have to apply it to. So I think that sort of uh, frames the way I look at things as, as a lawyer and as a judge. Um, and it gives me a certain perspective on technical matters that I don't believe other applicants may have. Okay. Um, my other question is about um, a topic that we discussed, I believe someone on the commission might've asked you about um, either the last time you applied or the time before, and that is docket management. And, um, and specifically um, issuing orders promptly. Um, is there anything that you would, would like to share with the commission about, about that topic and, 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 and whether anything has, has changed one way or another since we last discussed it? Sure, and that, that topic has come up and I don't recall when it came up last time, but it has come up. At the time and is still the case, I, I don't really, understand where that is coming from. Um, I believe that I issue rulings in a timely manner. Um, I do believe it's important for a judge to get, get it right. And so that's important to me. And I do spend the time that is necessary to do the research and to get to what I believe is the right result, because I do not believe that appellate courts are there to do what trial judges should have done in the first place. Um, that being said, I, I work weekends. I work late to get my work done in a timely manner. I, I believe I have done that. Um, Mr. Bardos, I can't respond to anything specific because I've never been given specific. So all I would say is I believe I do issue timely ru uh, rulings. And I would point to what I do know, and that is in the, uh, Singh case and the Ortiz case, those are my writing samples, uh, you will see that in those cases, in the Singh case particularly, I knew absolutely zero about election law going into that. We had hearings in April, we had a hearing in late May, I issued a very detailed written order in mid-June. I believe that was a timely ruling considering the complexity of the issues and I read every case that was submitted by both sides and every case that my staff attorney gave me and I believe I issued a timely ruling. And then the Ortiz case, that is my other writing sample. In that case, briefing was closed at the end of February. Then the Florida Supreme Court came out with the Pedroza decision in... crazy on me. Okay, I believe you were talking about the Pedroza de decision. Correct, the Pedroza decision came out uh, in March. Um, and so I had to sort of re reanalyze uh, all of the briefing and the arguments in light of that decision. 
And again, uh, early May, I issued my written written ruling. So, thank you, Your Honor. That's that's very helpful. Thank you. Thanks, Commissioner uh, Commissioner Blocker. Good afternoon. I was just wondering if you could give an example of a time when you made a decision where you might have personally disagreed with the result, but it was what the law required. Uh, absolutely, and I, I believe um, Justice Gorsuch, in his confirmation, uh, made that same comment that he thought it would be almost impossible to be a good, good judge without uh, at least once making a decision that you did not like. Um, Ms. Blocker, I would I would point to probably one of my earliest decisions, which is it is in my application, the culinary decision, and that was an injunction case where the the facts were just horrific. I mean, I still see the the video in my mind. It was horrible. Uh, this man brutally hit this woman in the head with a rock. However the statute, the plain language of the statute required that the parties, if they didn't share a child in common, to have lived together in the same same single dwelling unit. That was the language that the legislature chose. It was undisputed that they did not have children together. It was undisputed that they were homeless and they just slept on the sidewalk. It's a very tragic case in a lot of ways. I asked questions, have they ever lived in a hotel room? I even asked if they had ever lived in a tent. I don't know that tent, quite frankly, would make it fit within the plain and ordinary meaning of single dwelling unit, but the answer in any event was no. And I dismissed the petition because the legislature defined it and I had to follow the law. And that was a very difficult decision for me uh, it had political consequences for me as well. Uh, my opponent used that in my 2012 campaign, but the legislature has not changed the statute since then. And I believe that I made the decision that was required of me as a judge. And that is not to change the law or to try to fix what I believe the legislature didn't get right. Uh, but I did not like that result. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Commissioner Citro. Your Honor, in the course of your tenure on the criminal bench, have you had occasion to reject a negotiated plea between the state and the defense? Yes. All right, if you would, just tell us about those. Of rejecting a negotiated plea? Yeah, what was it that made you decide that this was not an appropriate plea in the case? Well, without knowing of the specifics, uh, I couldn't really respond, but in terms of in a general sense, um, I would look at what is the charge, um, what is the score sheet require, uh, what is the nature of the penalties authorized by the legislature, and what facts am I provided, and then determine strictly on that whether I believe I am willing to accept that as the appropriate sentence or whether I would need to hear more before I could make a final decision on what was the appropriate sentence. To the best of your recollection, have you ever rejected a negotiated plea because the offer from the state was too harsh? I, I think there I think I have done that on occasion where I didn't think it was an appropriate sentence, perhaps a prison offer where I didn't know that prison was an appropriate sentence based on what I knew. Uh, now, as you've heard, uh, Commissioner Dyer is a criminal lawyer, so the rest of us on the commission are a little familiar of how uh, how strange those criminal lawyers could be. But uh, when I called around and I asked one of the things I heard from both defense and prosecutors is that you tend to micromanage cases on your docket. Do you think that's a fair criticism? And if so, why? And if not, why? When you say micromanage, I'm not... Get too involved in, in, the, in the position of where the litigants are as opposed to staying on the bench. Active, not in the sense that you're trying to impose uh, a new law or something, but active in the sense that you're trying to replace your role, uh, or rather the litigant's role with, with your position. 
I, I don't believe that I do that. Okay. Like I said, it, it was a, the question was whether you think that's a fair criticism or not. Those are all the questions I have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Diarmas. If you could pick a rule of civil procedure to change, which would it be and why? Um, hmm. Rule of civil procedure. Either the text of the rule or the way it's applied, either way. Uh, I believe that, well, I, I believe the rule on summary judgment, I think that that, and my, my understanding is the Supreme Court is looking at that right now. That to me, I don't, I don't know that it really serves the purpose that it was intended to serve. Now, whether the proper use of that rule or change that rule would be to take it as far as they do in federal court. I haven't really thought through that, but I think the case law had developed in Florida to such an extent that summary judgment really was almost uh, without meaning or effect. All right, thank you, no more questions. Uh, Commissioner Dyer. Uh, how are you doing again, Judge? I would like to take that a step further. Which one of the criminal rules of procedure do you think has a flat right now? I'm sorry, which rule of criminal procedure what? Procedure would you feel needs to be modified, changed, or completely done away with? Criminal procedure. Yeah, Mr. Dyer, nothing really comes to mind immediately in terms of criminal procedure rules that, that at least in my experience, that, that I have found to be, you know, problematic or not really effectuating what I think they were intended to do. Nothing really comes to mind. Well, what is your position concerning the, the, the discovery rules for criminal procedure? Are you satisfied with the way those are working out? In, in my experience, I think the discovery rules have worked out. Okay. Uh, in fact, recently, I just said, we are starting trials now in Orange County. Um, and just the other day, we had a trial and the state uh, admittedly had committed a discovery violation and failed to disclose a witness witness was disclosed on the date the voir dire commenced and after a Richardson hearing I excluded the witness. Well congratulations judge thank you very much I have no other questions. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Eisenhower. Good afternoon again. Um, I wanted to know if you had a particular appellate case, either Florida Supreme Court or any of the uh, DCAs in Florida that has come out recently that you've really, really appreciated the reasoning in the decision and why. Florida Supreme Court or fifth DCA? A any of the Florida appellate courts either. Oh, okay. Uh, there was a recent decision um, I think it was Williams. Um, it was an en banc decision from the Fifth District Court of Appeal and a very interesting decision, but I, I really, um, I thought it was well-written. It was en banc, I believe Judge Traver wrote it and just applied a sort of a plain language analysis uh, as well as looking at some other uh, opinions to to basically recede from a prior decision and hold that a, uh, I believe it was a condominium assessment was in fact a consumer debt under the Florida Consumer Protection Act, Collection Protection Act. I think that was earlier this year. Thank you. Thank you. I also wondered if you could describe uh, a situation anytime in your career where uh, you were supporting a position or taking a stand um, in opposition to uh, what your colleagues or coworkers wanted to do. 
and uh, how that was resolved. As a judge? Any time in your career, really. It could be, you know, pre-bench uh, or, or as a judge. Hmm. And when, I guess, are you talking about in rendering it? Because as, as a trial judge, since we don't, since we handle our own cases, I, I can't, we don't really work together on that. I'm not, maybe I'm misunderstanding your question. I want to make sure I answer your question. No, that's true. As a judge, it probably wouldn't come up as much that you would have a conflict with your your colleagues or coworkers. So um, maybe if you can remember a time prior to uh, getting on the bench. Sure. Um, well, there were times, I guess, without disclosing client confidences as a labor and employment lawyer, uh, there were times when I would disagree uh, with some members of uh, the management team as to how to best address a certain issue that I thought, and there may be some exposure legally, depending upon what course we took with respect to an employee. And I would have those times and I would have the discussion and sometimes the clients followed my advice and sometimes they did not. And uh, But regardless, uh, after we talk together in private, that's where my disagreement would lie. And then uh, whatever the decision was, that was obviously my job to go and defend whatever decision the client had made. But I, I'm certainly willing to speak my mind uh, and sh share with people who, when we're trying to come to some collaborative decision to express my views in a, in a civil way, in a polite way, in an intellectually honest way, um, and I think I could do that on the Fifth District Court of Appeal, even though I believe there certainly would be times where I may not agree with all of my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you. Judge, I have one question for you. It's a hypothetical. If you were allowed to keep only one, the separation of powers in the Constitution or the Bill of Rights, which would you choose? Hmm. Well, I guess what I would choose, that's a very difficult choice, but I think I would choose the separation of powers because you said in that instance, although we would lose the Bill of Rights, we still would have our Declaration of Rights in our Florida Constitution. And so... I think that would be a better alternative than losing the separation of powers entirely. Um, thank you, Judge. Thank you. Okay. Um, that concludes the uh, Q&A section. Um, this is your opportunity to make some closing remarks. Oh, thank you. Well, again, I wanna express my uh, appreciation uh, to all of you for your, for your service and for considering me for this position. As I stated earlier, I, I humbly believe that uh, I can best serve our community by serving as a district court judge. And after considering my application, um, hearing from those who are supporting uh, my application and my nomination and hearing my answers to your questions today, I hope that you will do me the honor of selecting me as one of the nominees for this vacancy. And thank you again very much. And Judge, I want to thank you for your service. Thank you. Appreciate it. And thank you for coming here today. Have a pleasant afternoon, sir. All right.